Provost Rouse and I are pleased both to welcome you to this Roots of Greatness luncheon. Please join me in thanking our student performers, Molly and Ariel and Jessica and Mike. Give them a round of applause for performing. Would you please? All of you here are part of our first 50 years, and we have chosen to call all of us the founding generation of UMBC, the faculty, the staff, the students, and then people who become alumni. And so I'm going to do something a little different. I want you, if you can, and if you are either a faculty member or a staff member or a student, or you've ever worked or studied at UMBC, to stand up right now. Let me see who you are. <laughs> and keep standing. And keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. Now, if you came to UMBC in the current century, please be seated. In the, in the current century. OK? Let me see how well you can follow instructions. <laughs> if you came, if you came in the 1990s, please be seated. Let me first say, you all look good because the rest of you are pretty old, but you look pretty good. Wait, you look really good, all of you. Wait a minute. If you came in the 80s, please be seated. Wow. That's impressive. If you came in the 70s, please be seated. Wow. So every, give them a round of applause, first of all, for everybody before 1970. Very impressive. You look great. You really do. You look great. Now, if you arrived before 1970, please be seated. If you haven't thought about it, that means you came here in the 60s, right? <laughs> Give them a big round of applause. Very nice. That's, that's amazing. And so I want to say something. If you came, don't wait, 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 wait. If you were here when the university opened its doors, please remain standing. Everybody who was not here when, you get my point, only if you were here when we first opened our doors, as a student or a faculty member or a staff. Wow, give them all a big round of applause. Wow, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Please be seated. Now, let me just say that I had someone come up to me today, this is not in my script, and he said, I was the first employee of UMBC. He said he was the first librarian. Where are you, John? Get up and let me see. Give him a round of applause. First librarian. <laughs> it's an amazing story. And George Lou said, you're in the book, you're in the book. And, they, and what's amazing is that he was telling me that he was hired months before that to go ahead and start getting books so that when the first students came in, there were 25,000 volumes there in the library. Give him another round of applause. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. When I first came here, the university was 20 years old. That was in the beginning of 87. And it's so interesting. Even then, I could tell it was a place on the move. My wife had worked it before, and she was always telling me what a wonderful set of people here, and I got to see it for myself. And so later on today, you're going to get a chance to hear about the, the rich history of our university. You'll be hearing from Dean Emeritus John Jeffries and Professor Emeritus of Public Policy George Lanou. And from the beginning, if you think about it, we were a swath of farmland. And now today, we are a campus listed among the ranks of the most respected research universities in the country. I can think of no better testimonial to who we are and what we've achieved than the words of Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, who was our commencement speaker this year. She said this, and I quote, your example, as UMBC, is so important 
Many colleges, in fact, most colleges, have not figured out how to do as good a job as UMBC at enabling all students to reach their highest potential. You show the world what is possible. That's an amazing statement from the president of our oldest university, saluting one of the youngest. We have 70,000 alumni all over the world. Last night, I listened to policy analysts and it was a PhDs from, in public policy from UMBC. And one never thinks about all the possibilities. And yet, we had someone who had been top person in technology at Social Security Administration, first PhD, all, who became the, the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, all the way over to, as far as I know, our first admiral. She is the Deputy Surgeon General. Uh, and it's a woman, first admiral, big deal. Give them both a round of applause, would you? <laughs> And here's the point that we have doctors and lawyers and teachers and social workers and artists and entrepreneurs and people in any possible field making a difference in the world. I, re I often use the words of Aristotle because my colleagues here know that we all work so hard as thinking about grit to think about excellence. And it was Aristotle who said, excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the choice, the wise choice of many options. And then he said something that I always say that gives me goosebumps. He said, choice, not chance, determines destiny. Choice, not chance, determines destiny. UMBC has chosen well to work to be the best, to bring in all kinds of people. I want to recognize a few people today. It was our beloved Walter Sunheim. And if you're back to campus, you'll see we have one statue on campus. And it is of our muse, I often say, Walter Sunheim, who, who was amazing in that he was the chairman of the school board in 1952, took the first kids of color into Baltimore Poly. 50 years later, he was still on the school board, on the state school board, and lived until his late 90s with a keen mind. And he saw this campus as his dream fulfilled, of what he hoped for America. But he said this, he said, if you begin recognizing people and you go beyond three, you've made everybody in the room angry. <laughs> I just want to recognize a couple of people. The person who hired me, the faculty chose me, but the person who hired me is Donald Langenberg, and I'm told he's in the room. Donald and Pat, please stand. Would you all stand up? Our, our chancellor of the University of Maryland, he's somewhere around here, and Pat were here. That is, there's Pat, there, that's Don. Hey, Don, stand up. Give Don a hand, would you? That is so nice. Don and, and the faculty and staff took a chance on me, and I appreciate that. Uh, and then we have the faculty members of our beloved founding chancellor. At that time, the heads of campuses were called chancellor. And for those of you who might remember that, we now call them presidents. But our beloved, the family of our beloved Chancellor Alvin Okun, the family members are here. Where are the family members? Please stand. Let us see. It's really wonderful that they're here. Give them a round of applause. Even after Dr. Kuhn had not, was not able to see as well, he would call me and talk about what he had learned about UMBC. He was always so encouraging to me and so many others. And I often thought about the fact that he might have been not able to see so well physically, but he was seeing so much even as I talked to him and the love. And he saw how the university continued to grow and it was so inspiring. Uh, we have many people who have now are now no longer with us. And you can just think of all the names from Homer Shamp to, to, to just so many, so many. Um, I think of Dick Neville, I think of so many. And I want us to take a moment of silence just in honor of all those who are no longer here on earth. Thank you very much. And now I'm delighted to, to welcome to the stage Professor Emerita of Theater, Wendy Salkai. And some of us have seen her in plays for years and years, and we're delighted she's here somewhere with those other visionaries like Xerxes and others and Sam. I see all these, the theater folks are around. It's just wonderful. Please come on, Wendy. I always say I'm the president of Wendy's fan club. Wendy Salkai, please. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
Good morning, we must be close to afternoon. Alban Okun, the founding chancellor of UMBC, wasn't much on speeches and statements. His first letter to students, printed in the very first edition of what would eventually become the Retriever Weekly, observed dryly that, quote, we do not expect UMBC to be quite like any other campus, end quote. But more to the point of the reason for our gathering today, he also noted that, quote, you will find many open doors to the offices of the faculty and staff who are anxious to make UMBC an outstanding center for educational adventure, end quote. That's been true for 50 years now. And in large part, it has been an adventure created by many of the people gathered here today. Years after his retirement at UMB, as UMBC's chancellor in 1970, Kuhn reflected on what he helped build in oral history interviews with Emeritus Professor of American Studies, Ed Orser, and Associate Professor of History, Joseph Tatarevich. Kuhn's memories are an excellent place to start our commemoration of UMBC's 50th anniversary. Many of the principles he relied upon to create UMBC stretch forward from our founding to the present day. In an interview with Ed Orser, Kuhn spoke about the sales pitch he used to recruit the founding faculty of UMBC. That was the thing we talked about a lot when we were trying to attract original faculty and staff. Want to be a pioneer? Come join us. You can develop it and help to make it what it will be. It wasn't a bad thing to get that kind of person, end quote. Kuhn began his career in agronomy. He was a grower. And he brought that background along with him to grow UMBC. Agronomy is a highly interdisciplinary field. Agronomists had to work across boundaries with biologists, botanists, and entomologists. Kuhn told Tatarevich that interdisciplinarity was a concept he also saw as vital to UMBC. At the time we came to being developed, he said, universities were undergoing an evolution toward, as Clark Kerr said in one of his speeches, a prime instrument of national purpose. You can't do that with just science. You have to do that with understanding people. You have to do that with understanding the real drive that's involved in the humanities and the arts. When you put it all together, it can be really forceful. Without all of it together, you won't get there." End quote. Thinking back to that opening day, September 19th, 1966, Kuhn also gave an interview to the University of Maryland's magazine. One thing he said captures the newness of the spirit and the quest to never settle in a spot of knowing, but to keep striving. Quote, just like a youngster, we don't have all the answers, but we do want to develop our own personality and become a part of the Baltimore metropolitan area, end quote. UMBC has become an essential part of our region, our state, our nation, and the world. That's quite an achievement for a university first 50 years. Kuhn also provided the words that our current president, Freeman A. Hrabowski III, continues to say to our graduates as they leave the university community to find their own paths. They are special words and still ring true for successive generations. Many of you probably know them and feel free to speak along with me. Quote, if you bring to the future the same personal qualities and personal commitment you have brought to this campus as students. Good and important things will happen to each of you, as well as to those around you. And the university community will be proud to have played a part in your life." End quote. With that sense of commitment and pride, Let's begin our celebration. Thank you. As usual, right? 
Nothing else needs to be said. Let's enjoy lunch. We were all cooking all night. And in, just savor the moment. After lunch, uh, our provost, Philip Rouse, will come to the stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And many of them are right here in this room. What a special day. Enjoy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just about to get started with our program. If I could ask everybody to take their seats. Hope very much you've enjoyed the lunch. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Rouse, and I have the uh, incredible honor and privilege of uh, serving as provost at UMBC. Uh, I came to UMBC in 1990. Um, I guess that's around about 26 years ago. And I really want to echo what uh, Freeman said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, my, my reaction to the events this weekend, to meeting you all today, is that we are indeed standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I also want to mention that you may have noticed that uh, Freeman and I um, have dressed rather similarly today. That's, of course, why I made sure you knew what my name was in case we got confused with one another. <laughs> Um, um, I guess that's the, what we've done here is the equivalent of the, of the UMBC version of the wardrobe, wardrobe malfunction. Um, but anyway, so this is a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend for our UMBC community. And I'm so pleased that all of you are here today for this very special occasion. Faculty and staff representing many eras of UMBC's history help plan this event. And I would just like to take a moment and ask the members of the planning committee here today to please stand so that we can thank each and every one of you. Please stand if you're on the planning committee. Our planning committee is a little shy. Now I'd like to recognize two very special groups of individuals being honored today, in addition to the founders Freeman recognized earlier. I'd like to ask all of our presidential and regents award winners, faculty and staff, to please stand. Please stand if you're a presidential or regents award winner. Wow. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. The recipients of the Presidential Awards for Teaching Research, uh, professional staff and non-exempt staff have earned the highest honor given in our community. We are inspired by your example of excellence and of course deeply grateful for your service to UMBC. The recipients of the Regents Awards are nominated by the campus and selected by a very competitive process from a set of nominees representing all University System of Maryland campuses. We are extremely proud that over the last 19 years, just under 20% of all the Regents Awards system-wide have gone to UMBC faculty and staff. So uh, just to consider that for the moment, uh, there are 12 uh, USM campuses, and we have obtained one-fifth of the awards uh, from that. This is an impressive record indeed. I am very pleased to announce that new recognition plaques have been installed actually just a couple of days ago in the lobby of the administration building and carry the names of all past and future presidential and regents awards recipients and serve as a lasting public record of their contributions to our community. I hope each of you will take the time to stop by and have a look at the plaques while you're on campus today. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our Jakubic, Wench, and Demorest recipients. These awards are the result of generous donations by UMBC faculty and staff who have established endowments to honor and support their colleagues. Our most recent award, the Marilyn E. Demorest Award for Faculty Advancement, was funded by our colleague, Marilyn Demorest, upon her retirement from UMBC. I know Marilyn is here today. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the entire faculty of staff of UMBC. Marilyn, where are you? Marilyn.
thank you, Marilyn. And uh, um, I wonder if I could ask that all winners of the uh, Jakubic Wench or Demarice Awards that are here today, um, could you please stand and be recognized at any one of those three awards we have today? Ah, uh, there you go, Dossie. So now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce two of our distinguished emeritus faculty. Dr. John Jeffries, Dean Emeritus of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, is a scholar of history. So it will not surprise you that he had the foresight to plan a multi-year project to collect and communicate the stories of UMBC's founders. This effort, John, has enriched our archives with many oral history interviews involving faculty, staff, and alumni. In addition, Dean Jeffries encouraged Professor Emeritus of Public Policy, Dr. George Lanou, to author, author a scholarly history of the campus called Improbable Excellence, the Saga of UMBC. I'm delighted that they are here today, along with two alumni who contributed to the project, to talk about their efforts to uncover the roots of UMBC. And so will you please welcome to the stage Dean John Jeffries, Professor George Lanou, Yasmin Karimian, and David Bennett. Thank you very much. Take it, the microphone is working? No? Now? It's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's been a pleasure to see and talk with so many, dare I say it, of my old friends. And I was particularly charmed to hear Philip credit me with foresight uh, for moving towards a more robust record of UMBC. Foresight is not one of those things usually associated with the historian's toolkit, uh, which tends to involve hindsight uh, a good deal more than foresight. In any case, a number of people over a number of years uh, have worked to try to create a documentary archival record of UMBC. This is, after all, not the first birthday celebration of UMBC. Um, and for many years, Ed Orser um, and Larry Wilt and Tom Beck and the library staff have worked towards a collection of oral histories and documents. Over the past close to a decade, um, I worked with a group of UMBC faculty and staff to further augment UMBC's institutional history. Uh, my group was able to persuade, didn't take a lot of persuasion, uh, Freeman, uh, and also Provost Art Johnson, Elliot Hirschman, and Phil Ra Philip Rouse um, to support the substantial growth of the documents um, in the archives, uh, and also to expand the oral histories. I think that the next historian of UMBC will have a somewhat easier time than George uh, because he or she will have a fuller record of UMBC. And last, I want to take this public opportunity to urge Freeman and urge Philip to continue uh, to fund the growth and development of the archives and to expand our oral history collections. And I think it's especially important in the shorter run to develop more oral histories. Our early faculty and staff and students have retired, are retiring, moved on, 
some sadly have passed, and their memories will provide perspectives and information not to be found in the documentary evidence they archives. So it's important to continue to develop institutional history, uh, and I urge the university to continue to put money into the archives and the oral histories. Uh, now I think George has a few introductory comments before I get to interrogate him. Thank you, John. Is this microphone working? Can you hear me? No. Or you can come off. Does this work better? Yes. All right, good. There was such a euphoria in this room. I've never quite experienced anything like it that I'm, I'm almost hesitant to interrupt the, the feeling in there. But uh, since John has uh, so uh, eloquently urged the university to further the, the role of uh, his historical preservation, I'm going to lobby for creating a better organized effort to recognize and bring together the role of our retired faculty and staff. This has been, this has been an incredible occasion and it's an incredible group and we need to preserve its strength and its communications. Now, with that, I need to change the mood. I want to talk to you about three academic nightmares. Perhaps some of you will resonate to them. One, it's the beginning of a new semester and you've prepared a dynamite presentation for your class but you can't find the room. <laughs> Number two, you have developed a very extensive research paper to be given at a national convention, and you find the room, but there's nobody there. <laughs> and three, you have engaged in an extensive research project you put together the manuscript, you wait for it to come from the publisher, and you get it, and it's flawed. There's a mistake in the document. <clears throat> this is improbable excellence, the saga of UMBC. You can see it has a really wonderful cover that Jim Lord did. I finished it, writing it the last year of my actual employment at UMBC on December 31st, 2013. It then got edited. The publisher promised to have it here on September 2nd. It came here last Tuesday. On Thursday, the bookstore sent it over to me to be signed, some signatures, and I looked through it, and the pictures were missing. <laughs> Twelve pictures that Richard Byrne and I had very carefully selected to show the, the energy, the drama, really, of this campus. They were gone. The press says it's the worst mistake they've made in 40 years, and they're going to make it right. But uh, we won't have uh, full copies of the book for you to have in your hands today, which I feel very badly about. The pictures themselves, I think, are important. One of them is uh, Sam McCready's production uh, at the Kennedy Center. Another one is uh, Don Zimmerman's lacrosse team, which won the America East Championship coming from behind 13 to two. There is a picture of Freeman Dabrowski and Robert Meyerhoff looking very conspiratorial, celebrating we can all guess what. There is a picture of the UMBC history team, and I'll say more about them in a moment. Two of them are sitting to my right. And perhaps the most dramatic picture of all was taken from um, Calcott's History of the University of Maryland, written in 1966. And it shows at the top of the frame College Park with its uh, Georgian red brick pillared campuses and Bird Stadium off to the right. And then at the bottom, 
it shows UMBC in 1966. We are literally a hole in the ground. <laughs> and I think the juxtaposition of those two pictures says something about what we're celebrating today. So. So, so George, why was it that you wanted to write this book? Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> uh, came to UMBC in 1973. Uh, so by the time I began working on the book in 2009, I'd been here for 36 years in various roles. Patricia had worked at UMBC since 1984 and was director of Inter uh, interdisciplinary studies for 12 and a half years. My two sons, Jeff and Revere, spent a lot of time at campus events and were uh, strong Retriever fans uh, before they moved on to their own athletic careers and their own graduate schools where they uh, added some new identities. And I was privileged to play a role in several of the critical events that uh, shaped the campus. So I thought I could find a way to tell the story of improbable excellence. And, and what contributions did you think the book was going to make as you set out on the journey? UMBC has dramatically expanded in almost every way you can think of in 50 years. But there's always an enriching new flow of students, faculty, administrators, who would have no way of knowing its history. And if you don't understand institutional history, you may have an incomplete view of institutional values. There was a particular event that I think uh, focused my attention on this. There was a, a discussion in one of my departments about space for emeritus faculty. It was a legitimate discussion. But then one of the assistant professors, who I happen to like a lot, said, well, they're emeritus. They're gone. When they're gone, <laughs> and I thought, young retriever pup, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here but for the contributions of these people. So I thought, but how would he know? How would he know? And so I thought, we needed to have a book. I think that once folks actually get their hands on the book and go through it, they'll see that the organizational scheme is a little different from that of many university histories. And in particular, it tends to have a focus and framework around the politics and policy of higher education. So I wonder if you could explain why you chose this focus and this organizational scheme. Well, guilty as charged. Um, one of the first things I did was to read several academic histories looking for a, a role model and a publisher. There are some wonderful coffee table books. Uh, Cambridge University in England has this spectacular book, but we lack some of the history and architecture of Cambridge. <laughs> uh, West Point has a book called Two Centuries of Honor and Tradition with chapters by General Norman Schwarzkopf, Stephen Ambrose, George Plimpton, Arthur Miller, David Ham Ham Halberstam, and Tom Wicker, but I wasn't certain we could do that. And I was easily persuaded not to have the book written by a committee. It's something I've really never regretted. The most common format is administration by administration chronology, kind of an encyclopedic view of university history. They are dull, dull, dull. And they don't exactly work for UMBC <clears throat> because of the extraordinary uh, achievements and tenure of, of Freeman Obrowski, so that a, an administration by administration organization for the book just was not right. Furthermore, I think a top-down view of the university really misunderstands the successes and failures that, uh, that happen on a daily basis in, the, in a university. Um, Administrators are enormously important, both system-wide and, and, and on this campus, but they don't teach classes. They don't get the research grants. Um, they don't direct plays and musical performances. They don't win games. All of those successes that come to make a university are really focused uh, on a decentralized structure 
and I wanted to cover that. Furthermore, uh, I wrote each departmental chair asking if they had a departmental history, and only two did, so that would have made it pretty hard to do it department by department. University of Maryland has no press. So the first thing I did was to pitch the book to the Johns Hopkins University Press. Logical. They replied with some considerable degree of condescension <laughs> that maybe nobody in academia would be very interested in a book about UMBC. Perhaps I should write a book about urban universities more generally. I decided that my audience was the UMBC community foremost and then Maryland citizens who are asked to support and regulate their state universities, they need to know the saga of UMBC. As far as for pleading guilty about the political focus, um, I am a political scientist. I taught education policy at Columbia, Chicago, and UMBC for 50 years. So that background certainly in interested me. There are a lot of lenses that you can look at when you confront the mass of materials that would describe any university. Uh, I chose to focus on the political climate that created UMBC and shaped its subsequent development, but also on the outcomes of various competitions UMBC has engaged in, the enrollment for bright students, program approval, research funding, athletics, and the arts. So each of the 13 chapters in the book is, is topically organized and, and then chronological within the chapter. So you can read it as a whole, or you can just read the chapter on the founding, or budgets, or service, or research, or athletics, or theater, or faculty, or students, and that's fine with me. Uh, but the topical approach I chose rather than write one uh, single uh, chronological history. What did you find in your research that was surprising or that was unexpected? I think the first thing I found that was surprising was the history of the campus lands. You know, we all work here, but we don't, most of us, think much about that. And there is actually archaeological evidence dating back to 8,000, 3,500 BCE. And they have found uh, uh, projectile points, uh, used to be called, be called arrowheads, I think. And, and, and other kinds of things which are now in a museum at, uh, in St. Mary's County. In the 17th century, the Piscataway tribe occupied the lands and uh, they would uh, kill wolves and then the white settlers would claim the bounty for the wolves. That was probably not politically correct, but was done. In the 18th century, Daniel Webster and Henry Clay would take waters at the Sulphur Spring Inn and the remnants of that are barely still on the campus. One would have loved to have eavesdropped on those conversations, I think. I didn't know anything about that. And also the role of Alvin Kuhn. Uh, we have heard uh, some wonderful things about him. I didn't know him. I came here the year after he, he left. And he had the most marvelous connections within the UM system where he had worked for many years and with state politicians. He had been the head of the Agricultural Extension Service and he knew everybody in every county. He conceived of the idea of the clustered buildings and a walkable campus cir circled by a loop road and he actually drove a tractor to make the road path. He managed to obtain a UMBC autonomy from College Park because he was deeply embedded in College Park, and he could say this campus needed autonomy, which was very important. He was not an autocrat. In his first years, he wanted to create a football team in ROTC. The faculty senate said no. On the negative side, what I didn't expect to find was the enduring political controversy about UMBC's role in the state, which is not abated, and which I wrote about in the penultimate chapter. So as the uh, Hopkins Press, in its wisdom, surmised, you do know an awful lot about other universities. So, uh, to what degree do you find UMBC's story sui generis? 
In some respects, UMBC was one of the several dozen new wave urban universities created in the 50s and 60s as the demand for higher education expanded and the traditional flagship campuses were not well located to handle the influx of new students or did not want to. And from the beginning, it was like the other new wave campuses designed to be a research institution. That's very important. In other respects, UMBC was very different. It was so close to the downtown UM campuses that it could never have the traditional array of professional schools. Further, there were so many other public and private universities in Baltimore, in the Baltimore metropolitan area, nine to be exact, that we did not have the built-in political and business support that say a University of California, San Diego, or a University of North Carolina, Charlotte had immediately. That made fundraising and program approval very difficult. As you were doing this, what particular challenges um, did you experience in the research and writing? Hmm. UMBC was growing so fast that looking respect, retrospectively often seemed a luxury until Dean Jeffries made it a priority. I wanted to write based on documents. There are 1,200 footnotes in the book. Um, as John would suspect, it wasn't written with a very breezy style. But the archival work was just beginning uh, at UMBC. Uh, one of my early tours was of the basement of the library. I don't imagine many of you have been there. Uh, and it's filled with very formidable looking fire, file cabinets. And nobody was very sure what was in those cabinets. So I asked to see what the political science file cabinet looked like. And sure enough, there were a number of binders that I had given the library uh, based uh, uh, that were related to previous attempts to uh, create mergers for UMBC. In time, uh, Lindsay Lo Loper, uh, Tom Beck, and Larry Wilt were of great help in organizing the uh, uh, archives and, and, and so that they supported the book very well. And then, as you've heard, fortunately, Ed Orser, Joe Tataravich, and Barry Lanham completed a series of very useful transcribed interviews with the founders uh, uh, and early faculty at UMBC. When the campus began, there were three Baltimore newspapers, and each had an education reporter. Uh, Mike Bowler, for example, of the Morning Sun uh, was, when anything happened in higher education, he knew it and he wrote about it. He read the whole manuscript and was a great help. Uh, now, local journalistic uh, records are much spar sparser, to put it mildly. Um, the Sun had, for a while, an education reporter a couple years ago. He now writes for the Ra about the Ravens. Um, so the problem was, how, how do you create records in a, in a situation where the archives are being formed uh, where uh, contemporary newspaper documents are really very sparse. And then I got lucky, serendipity, and it came in the form of the UMBC undergraduate research tradition. I was lecturing on higher education desegregation in my con law class one day, and I mentioned a few things about UMBC's history, the only non-segregated public university in the state. And students were very interested. I was, you know, it's one of those moments when you're teaching and they, 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 they get engaged. And, and so I, I came up with the idea of forming the UMBC history team of nine undergraduates who wrote extensive original research papers on various topics in the book. Some of their work was so good I had difficulty avoiding plagiarism because their research and articulation was so impressive. Their papers and all of the underlying documents in the book are now in the archives. And when you see the book, their team picture graces the book. And we're fortunate to have two of their representatives with us today, Yasmin Carminian and David Bennett. Why don't each of you say a few words about the challenges you faced in doing this research, what you got out of it, and what your post-UMBC career has been? 
Hi, I'm, I'm David, and uh, I had the privilege of working with, with Dr. Lanul in this book. It was, it was an interesting, how, how I got involved in it was kind of interesting. It was, um, I had heard about the independent study opportunity of working on, you know, a semester long on a, on a specific paper. I'm thinking I'm going to research, you know, HBCUs or civil rights or some Supreme Court cases, and, and Dr. Lanou had a, a much different idea on what that paper would look like. He threw me in the archives for, for several semesters, and, and from there, the rest is history, right? Um, yeah, I, I looked at the social studies, or the social sciences here at UMBC, so I, I had the opportunity to look at, at psychology and economics, political science, history. Uh, the opportunity to sit down with the various chairs of those departments and, and, and have conversations about, with some of them who have been here for, for many, many years, to discuss what that, what that department looked like back then and what it looks like now. And it, it, it's really quite astounding to see the determination of folks who are in their you know, early 30s to, to form and these, these departments to what they are today. Um, it, it was quite an honor to, to do that with you. And you were certainly an inspiration during my undergraduate time here at UMBC, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, now I'm a uh, health policy advisor for Senator John McCain in DC. Um, good afternoon, my name is Yasmin Karamian. I graduated in 2011. Um, I got connected to Dr. Lanou actually through Dr. Rabowski. I visited Dr. Rabowski one day and I said, Dr. Rabowski, I think I want to go to law school. And he looked at me and he said, go take um, Dr. Lanou's class, and if you get an A, we'll talk about it. And, <laughs> and that became how I got connected to Dr. Lanou, and I loved his classes and continued taking them and, and ended up um, on the UMBC history team. I did go to law school. I graduated two years ago from Georgetown Law. I now work at Amazon and Contracts. Um, but I actually got reconnected to Dr. Lanou. This past year, I ended up indexing the book um, with Dr. Lanou, and, and so that, that was really wonderful. Um, I think the biggest challenge is there is so much history, so much diversity, so much personality, so many stories. And so figuring out, um, and I think Dr. Lanou um, did, did just, I, I had the chance to read the book, so it was just wonderful how he actually made those a fluid story because I think you probably had the same experience when I was doing the research, I would go down one path and just be like, oh, this is an amazing story, and I want to include this, and then there would be 45 others of amazing people that were part of our community. And so making sure that we stayed on that path, there, there was many ways I think that the research could have gone, and, and I think it worked out wonderfully. Thank you. So George, to, to conclude, what would you say are the principal conclusions that you drew from your study? <laughs> Or a few of them. <laughs> there is a last chapter called Conclusions. <laughs> One is that UMBC's location turned out to be a great plus. There was some ambiguity about that. Uh, we were placed as far south in Baltimore County as you could possibly be placed because Towson State is in the county seat. But we are, in fact, in the center of the state and increasingly transportation has gotten easier and our location has been a plus. We are also located in, in one of the greatest centers in the world of talented professionals of all sorts. And so we draw on those and can connect with those uh, professionals and those organizations as a research institution. Our STEM fo focus has been a major advantage and will be in the future. Maryland has high quality public education and so produces many good students who formerly had to go out of state to get the kind of uh, uh, research undergraduate experience that they needed. UMBC has developed a national reputation of excellence in many areas, in part because of the unflagging efforts of Dr. Browski but also because of the work of faculty and staff that made those uh, claims of excellence credible. Freeman would say, would be the first to say that success is never final. And we face a number of future challenges, some special to UMBC and some confronting higher education more generally. 
Given our ambitions, UMBC is still inadequately supported by state funding and private giving. Demonstrated that in the book. It still faces a, a hurdles in program approval. And should the, pro, the plaintiffs prevail in a case now in the federal courts uh, called the coalition case, described at some length in the book, uh, then some UMBC might lose some of its key programs. Uh, then there is the problem of, which is a national problem really, that the ambitions of state flagship campuses for global eminence may end up trans trampling the welfare of other public institutions. And the pressure for a final merger of the University of Maryland College Park and the University of Maryland Baltimore to form the University of Maryland still exists. UMBC's political infrastructure and support network is still a work in progress. Finally, in the last several decades, the academic enterprise nationally has become less collegial and more corporate in its character. There is more emphasis on institutional branding and insatiable seeking for status and a trend toward using faculty as income producers rather than as truth seekers. Consequently, there is less concern for sponsoring public policy debates, for intellectual diversity and shared governance at many campuses. You heard Harvard President Drew Faust uh, quoted before, and I'll quote her on another point in concluding. She wrote, universities are meant to be producers not just of knowledge, but also of often inconvenient doubt. They should be creative and unruly places. But at this moment in our history, universities might well ask if they've done enough to raise the deep and unsettling questions necessary to any society. Have universities become too captive to the immediate and worldly purposes they serve? Has the market model become the fundamental and defining identity of higher education? Historians are not good prophets, and so improbable excellence concludes this way. For UMBC, with uncertain political support, an awkward name, surrounded by well-established public and private competitors, and unable to launch its own professional schools, seeking excellence at its founding by following the traditional route seemed almost most improbable. Instead, UMBC has developed a new model, and perhaps the quest for excellence may be a permanent part of UMBC culture. The only, the only thing that can be known for sure is that the past cannot be changed, but the future depends on those who care for it. Thank you. I think we have some time uh, for questions from the audience. Let me start it. Uh, I'm in the First of all, thank you very much. All of you for the book, for the analysis. My question has to do with the politics of, of Maryland House Education. And you had a chance to look at what's happened in recent years and the role that different legislators, the role that different legislators have played in Maryland higher education. Uh, you are aware that uh, our alumna, um, Adrian Jones, is the speaker pro tem and by all measures the most powerful woman and one of the most powerful legislators in, uh, in our state legislature. The question is this, what role do you see uh, this university playing or has it actually played already in producing people like Delegate Jones from the social sciences, actually from psychology, um, in helping to protect the institution as you think about the power of legislators to move institutions in one direction or another? Well, that's a very good uh, question with a very complicated answer, uh, and I'll be very brief. Uh, you're perfectly correct that Adrian Jones was, has been pivotal. I mean, just 
without her, I, some pretty bad things might have happened. But we cannot depend on a particular legislator or even a group of legislators. We need to develop a more broad-based political support. Uh, we need to think about a strategy so that the value that UMBC provides to this state uh, is well recognized and can be mobilized uh, better than we have uh, been able to do in the past. And to make the link to this event, uh, the retired faculty and staff, many of whom are here, uh, have many connections and a deep affection and understanding of this institution. We need to be able to reach out to them and they need to be able to reach out to the political structure in this state to protect the university. And we have not had that in place and you can't create it overnight. And we need to do it so that when we have to mobilize to protect ourselves, to enhance our ability to serve the state, those resources are in place. Oh, I'm sorry. Downtown, you said? I thought you said College Park. I, the proposal was to merge College Park and the downtown campuses. Excuse me, I misunderstood. Thank you. There have been, in the past, uh, proposals to merge UMBC and the downtown campus that would have been successful but for the opposition of Senate President Mike Miller. Uh, but there has never been a proposal to merge UMBC and College Park, and I don't think that would ever happen. I think we have time for one more question. If there is anybody? Hi, um, I'm concerned. Um, I started at UMBC when they started, and I'm concerned because partly about what you talked about, but when I started, you could go to UMBC with not much uh, worry. You could work in the summer. And since then, um, almost throughout not only Maryland, but other states, uh, most middle and lower income students are being priced out. And that, that's a concern, and I, I wonder, we're talking also in larger things about uh, income inequality and things like that, and uh, that should be a part of the story, too. How, what, 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 uh, how does that fit into the story? Well, the, the history of UMBC's uh, Budgetary support from the state and private giving is in a chapter uh, of its own. And you're correct, the, the national trend has been for state governments to provide less and less uh, support for state universities, which has put tremendous pressure, particularly on universities like UMBC, which do, do not have uh, substantial endowments. But UMBC is still uh, a pathway for first-generation students and students from non-traditional backgrounds. And our record in producing success for those students is really quite admirable. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. Please join me in uh, thanking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, John, uh, Yasmin, and David for all your efforts in, in, in the book and on the presentation um, today. Now, as you probably noticed, in a few moments, the uh, UMBC camarada will lead us in the singing of our alma mater. Um, but before we do that, I just have a few organi organizational announcements for you. Um, 
Copies of George's book, uh, as George mentioned, are, are not quite yet available. They'll be available soon. But you can pre-order at the bookstore table that's just outside in the lobby. And also a form's going to be available for you to provide contact information and any inscription that you would like uh, from George uh, in your copy of the book. The books will be mailed to you as soon as they're available. Uh, for those of you taking the campus tour, the bus tour following lunch, uh, please exit to the right as you, uh, as you leave the, uh, of, of the room. And finally, I hope you're, I, I actually know, you're going to be able to join us for the other activities we have planned today. Um, you've got a celebration program. It's on your seats. You've seen it. Uh, we have uh, so many things going on. I can't mention them all. We have the House of Grit with hands-on activities, the Dog Pound uh, with children's programming uh, by the athletic department. Uh, and we have, uh, believe it or not, an entire layout of the campus um, constructed from Lego, uh, which is quite something. Um, we have our Grit X. This is our version of TEDx. This is Grit X Talks with faculty and alumni speaking on a variety of very interesting topics. Uh, we have our men's soccer game versus uh, the George Washington University. Um, a puppy parade uh, a little bit later today. And then we have Stoop Stories of Personal Memories presented by early alumni, faculty, and our own president, Freeman Rabowski. And this all ends with a, today with a community picnic, the UMBC Symphony, and fireworks this evening. Now, some of you may not know that UMBC has an alma mater, which we're very proud of. It's titled Our UMBC, and it debuted in 2006 in conjunction with the 40th anniversary. We have begun the tradition of ending our more formal events and ceremonies with the alma mater. And so what I'd like you to do, following the tr tradition of all great universities, I'd like to ask that you please stand and join us in the singing uh, with the UMBC camarada of our alma mater. And if you're not familiar with the words, they're printed on the back cover of the program. And I would please ask again that uh, as we stand that uh, we do not leave the room uh, out of respect uh, for our university during the singing of the alma mater. Thank you very much. First of all, give them a hand for looking really good, right? <laughs> just, just one comment. Uh, Frank Bruni of the New York Times was on campus in the last week, and so look out for a really nice piece that includes a lot about UMBC. Big deal when you get coverage in the New York Times, but Bruni's article for the weekend. Look out for it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all uh, once again. We've, we are delighted that you have come home today. 
and we hope you enjoy the continuation of the wonderful 50th celebration. Thank you so much. Welcome home. Very nice. Very nice.